the get the show on the road. I see that we have some people listening in. Uh, welcome everybody. Welcome to Lab Day Online Spring 2021. Uh, my name is Menno Potts. We're going to talk uh, together with uh, Andrew Cameron. I'm going to talk about digital dentures and especially how to grow your lab with uh, digital dentures. Um, I would like to first to uh, introduce myself. Uh, like I said, my name is uh, Menno Pot. Uh, I'm a dental professional almost for 30 years now, and I am a pr prosthetist. And since 2013, so almost eight years now, I've been working with the company that is called Nextdent, which is a part of the 3D systems. And within that company, I'm the senior application uh, engineer uh, for dental. Um, a little bit about the background of Vertex Dental. Vertex Dental has been around for several years, more than 80 years to be exact. It was founded in 1939 and we basically made uh, PMMA, so the powder and the liquids to, for making uh, denture base, classic denture bases in orthodontics. And that knowledge we've, we've taken and now we have our main focus on creating the resins for 3D printing. Um, so, uh, a little bit also about 3D systems. Um, like I mentioned, Nextend is now a uh, part of 3D systems. And 3D systems actually also is not a new company. It's been around 30 years. And actually, 3D systems is the inventor of the SLA printing technology. And uh, the uh, person on the left here is uh, Chuck Hall. He is the inventor of the SLA and founder of 3D systems. So together with 3D system that uh, they know all about uh, 3D printing and Vertex Dental, they know all about the chemistry and dental. I think we make a great team. The next at 5100, that is the dental printer from uh, Nextdent 3D Systems. And uh, we have a broad variety of materials. We can see the bottles uh, below in the screen. But today we're going to focus on the resins that belong to the denture workflow. Uh, the workflow will be uh, um, uh, de uh, discussed in detail by Andrew. Um, but I would like to point out a little bit uh, about the materials in, uh, that we use. Uh, yes, Andrew. Uh, so first of all, I like to explain or I'd like to talk about uh, our first resin that is called Crown and Bridge MFH. Now, what does a Crown and Bridge material do in a denture uh, webinar? Uh, this material is also suited for printing tooth arches that can be used in the dentures. And again, uh, Andrew will explain a little bit more about that in the upcoming moments. Next to that, we have a full range of materials we can start by just uh, going digital by printing a, a individual tray. Of course, uh, an important part of the denture workflow is the try-in material. Um, as you might know, uh, it, it, it's very difficult to uh, get the impressions right, but uh, also very difficult is the um, is the byte registration. And in order to con or to check this, the try-in material is a perfect tool. You, what used to be a wax up can now be printed in a, uh, uh, in a plastic. And uh, th this allows you to check the bite height, occlusion, articulation, and even uh, phonetics and stuff like that. And then, of course, the material, which is uh, part of, uh, the, I would say, the most important in this workflow is the denture-based material. And that's uh, the denture uh, 3D plus material, which we will have in uh, uh, six colors. Um, that's it for my uh, part. We only have 30 minutes, so I would uh, uh, hand it over. Like to hand it over to Andrew Cameron, lecturer in dental technology from the Griffith University in Australia. Andrew, please take it away. Thanks, Benno. So uh, today I'll be taking on you on a little bit of a journey about how you can get started in this digital denture realm. I've been doing this for quite some time, so I've gone through this whole experience myself. But first, I'd like to just declare that although I am an employee of Griffith University, all the materials and opinions in this presentation are mine and do not represent those of the institution. So a little bit about me. As Menno said, I work at a university, but I'm also a dental technician and a clinical dental technician, and I've been doing this for about 21 years now. This is where I am on the Gold Coast, uh, and it's actually 4.30 in the morning. So don't worry, I've already had a few coffees to wake me up. 
I'm also an academic, so I participate in research. Uh, the vast majority of it is around removable prosthodontics and also additive manufacturing. Um, I have several publications already, several under review, and I'm working on many more. So as I said, I'm clinically active. Uh, there's me with my intraoral scanner. Uh, we have a variety of 3D printers where we are, but the, the real uh, one that I'm focusing on at the moment is the 5100 from Nextent. So why am I active in this space? Well, the first thing you should know is that I am conducting a clinical trial utilizing uh, Nextent 3D Plus and Nextent MFH. So I have garnered quite a bit of experience using these materials, not just with the material science and, and how we apply those, but also the clinical workflows that we can use to make digital dentures. We're assessing tooth wear, physical characteristics, dimensional stability, and also patient perception and mucocompressive adaption. So we're looking at how these materials function on a, on a, on a higher level. And this trial is well, well underway. So when we start talking about digital dentures, there's an awful lot of information out there. You'll see people talking about intraoral scanning. Uh, I do a lot of that myself. They'll be talking about reference dentures or coffee dentures. They might be talking about using small designs to integrate that into your design. They might even be talking about um, reference dentures where you, you're not even using any wax or anything like that. But I find the information out there is can be quite complex and applying these things clinically is definitely not where you want to start. So where should you start? Well, through this trial, I've tried to keep things simple. You can see here's an example of some dentures that have actually been in the patient's mouth for, for over six months now, so that they work and function very well. And I've gone on a little bit of a journey, which I like to call the conventional digital workflow. This is where I think all practices should start and then they should move away from that and move into some more advanced techniques, which I spoke about earlier. So we should apply some concepts that we already have, such as standard silicon impression taking, still pouring models, but then we start using some digital materials. The base plate's really good if we use uh, the try-in material, print those, place wax rims on the top of it, and what that allows us to do is, if we are wanting to take wash impressions in these, you can do it really well. And the reason you can do it really well is you've got a very stable base that won't deform when you pour it up. So there's already a number of advantages. You'll notice here, here's a try-in um, that I've printed as well. Um, a lot of people initially have a bit of a skepticism about using this technique but I find the advantages far outweigh any disadvantages that might be there. So if we have a look at trays um, as an initial starting point, this is really good. I don't think I've not made a printed tray in the last four years for removable prosthodontics. Um, I hate doing them by hand. Printing is much more accurate. You actually get a better impression because you get such a more uniform uh, layer of impression material. But not only that, it allows you a lot more control. So you can see here in our workflow where we're doing a quick outline there. You can also block out certain areas in this pink outline you can see, create our tray, have our, our STL. We can orientate it here, we can see in 3D Sprint. So here's one of the things that we need to consider when we are printing that orientation is important and I'll speak about that a little bit later. And then the, the beauty about printing trays is, is you can stack quite a few on a build plate. Now I've got this next clinical case here that I'll show you. And this is a lady with an extremely difficult ridge and, and you saw that before. And this is a printed tray we can see here. So we can see no impression material in there already. Um, we've, we've just got a, a very flat ridge of an intraoral scan and we've got suction there already. And if you've got that there to start with, you're gonna be working towards a very good impression. So we can see here, here's our final, final actually impression there. I'm very happy with that scan that in. 
And what I always do is make a, a base plate to make a bite block one in this more, what I like to call traditional conventional impression. This make, means that you're gonna have a stable base, it's gonna stay in the mouth. You can take a more accurate bite, which means you're gonna have less try-ins and a better workflow as, as an overall. So that brings us to the next point about making these base plates. So we need to, to rethink this a little bit. A lot of people will say, oh, I've designed a, a base over the model and it's not really fitting the way that I want for articulation. And we need to remember that this actual base plate itself isn't the final denture. So we can take a few minor liberties with that. And how I like to do that is I always block out any minder undercuts. This can be done in the software. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the software itself, you can see that I'm using three shape. Yes, I am a three shape user, um, always have been, and that's what I prefer to use. I know other softwares can do this, but by blocking out these minor undercuts here, when we come to actually digitally articulate these models, we don't have any problems with the actual base, as you can see here, fitting this model. So it will go onto this very accurately so that we can articulate it. I also, uh, we can see here's a cross section. We can see through here, this particular case. And I always like to leave it slightly short. This won't affect your try -in. This will still mean it's nice and stable uh, on the upper. Uh, you'll generally have really good retention. But leaving it slightly short like this allows us to actually take a wash impression if we need to. You may get right to these peripheries in some instances and you will actually overextend it. So I always like to give myself the option of taking a wash impression. And here's some printed bases. This is a, this is a different case as well, but it's really simple to do. These print quickly. Uh, you, you don't have any problems while um, uh, afterwards you, you simply take the supports off and then you place the wax rims on. And you'll notice here when I am doing these wax rims that, that I don't bring the wax all the way to the periphery. This is established for you. So from a commercial point of view, it's really quick. You're just adding a wax on the top of this. You're not having to uh, adapt any wax, soak any models, place any strengtheners. So I find that this process to actually make these bite blocks is quicker than a conventional one. Then when we have taken our bite and we've moved on to past that clinical process, which is what I'm not here to speak about, we're actually going to move to actually, um, you can see here and uh, forgive the noise, is that we're scanning that bite in. So it's, it's a really quick process and I suppose the advantage of this is that we don't need the models after this, even for any retries. And we're gonna align our models together. A good hint here too is that you'll notice with my models, I'm not worried about making them perfectly smooth because that added geometry there helps those models align within the computer software. So once you've scanned those models in, this is basically the process for aligning those really quick and that's your articulation. I can't do it that quickly with plaster and I, uh, I don't know anyone that really can. So we won't really dwell on the tooth setting here, but what I really would like to talk about is the actual monobrock digital try-in. When I first started doing this, because I do do this clinically as well, this was, this was a bit of a leap of faith for me. I felt at first, I thought, patients aren't going to like this any doctors that I sent this out they're not going to like this but it really isn't an issue patients are very accepting of it um, once you prepare them for it so you don't just go you know this is what your final dentures are going to look like at that that bite stage and even at that initial consultation you have a small conversation with the patient and say look I do things differently I 3d print my try-ins, which normally the patient makes them ooh, perk up and say, well, we're using some advanced technology here. But also you need to be talking to them about, about the color and we're looking to assess the, those physical areas. And generally um, 
every patient has a very high acceptance rate. So here's a few printed try-ins we can see here. So we've got three different colors in the next gen range. Um, I find I'm using the TIO, which is the widest one all the time. Uh, it matches pretty close in between the BL and N1 teeth shade. Um, but as far as shades go, we, we don't normally see patients making much of a comment on that. It allows them to look at form um, and function. But the real key advantage to this is that um, we can assess other areas very well. One comment that I will make on printing this particular geometric shape is the use of these supports. So you'll notice here, I've got an arrangement of different support structures here, and that's to allow this build to work into these high areas and maintain its shape. If you don't put these support structures in, and I've noticed this in other 3D printing as well, you're gonna have issues, uh, particularly with mandibles, uh, starting to spread in these areas. So we, we have those at a bit of an angle. We also have those at angles because if we've got them flat to the, the build play, we're gonna get some separation forces. So the best advice I can give for anyone that is printing a try-in because we've got to print them at this, this high 60 degree angle to get the best accuracy on the surface is to make sure you put these bar supports in and have them angled slightly off the build plate themselves. Why do we put these here though? Well, here's just two try-ins that I scanned just simply for the purposes of this, this presentation. And I, I printed one without bars and one with bars. And this is a 3D representation of accuracy. And we can see that with the bars, we, particularly in these posterior areas, we're getting quite, quite good uh, conformity to our CAD design. Whereas we take those away, we get additional forces in the anterior region, and we can start to see a pulling away of those posterior areas. I do um, comparative research with printers and, and mills, and you see this in all of the printing applications um, that you'll get when you start printing things at certain heights. Not as much when you've got a, a lower print height, but when you start to push out a little bit higher, it can be quite noticeable. So one of the, the things that I often get questions from, from students and, and practitioners that haven't gone in this is, you know, what if the bike goes wrong? So if your, your centric is out, um, this is my favorite technique for retaking the bite. I will grind off uh, the posterior teeth so they're nice and flat, even touch this in um, with some articulating paper and a burr. Then we can get that quite right, place a thin amount of wax in there for the patient to bite into, and then place some um, fast setting silicon in the front to align that together. We can see here, here's a particular patient that I've done that on. I think they were just getting a full full lower here, didn't want the new upper. But what we, what we should um, consider is that we don't need our models now. So we're gonna take those, we're gonna put that in our, our scanning uh, if we're using three shape and we're gonna scan those and it's gonna align our models together. A really good point to note here too is scanners don't like shiny objects. So a bottle of scan spray is a very handy thing to have. So we can see that scanning process happening here as well. So might just move this along where we're scanning those bites in and then it actually allows us to align those try-ins together. And what that'll actually do is it's aligning the models at the same time as it's aligning those try-ins. So I find this a very effective technique, particularly if you do decide to um, mark the upper anterior teeth for modification, i.e. if you've decide to move the midline or if you decide to uh, move the incisal edge up, you can actually cut those off with a burr if you need to at that stage. So it does, does take a little bit of use to get into the process. But once you get the idea that you've actually got some, some hard bits of plastic there to work with, there are actually more advantages. So where do I see these benefits? Well, the first thing is you've got an extremely stable base. You can't get away from the fact that if your bases aren't stable for any full dentures, you cannot assess the centric 
or the vertical dimension. So the advantages there from a clinical point of view are next to none. It's really easy to identify that centric and vertical dimension if there are discrepancies as opposed to wax where the patient can push through the teeth. It, in my opinion, it's um, more time efficient than setting teeth. I can get a try-in done as far as the scanning, setting the tooth in around about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on complexity of case. But I've done quite a few at this stage. Um, the retaking of the bite itself, uh, it's easier once you get the process down and I find it's far more accurate. And really one of the biggest advantages I find is that you can give these to patients. The next end, um, try materials are class one biocompatible material, which means it could stay in the mouth technically for 30 days. So I'll quite often give these to the patient, uh, take this home, have a meal with it, you know, have a, have a coffee. Sure, it might stain a little bit, um, but I see that as an advantage because they're not going to not come back. But it really gives the patient confidence that they can function um, with this, this new, new um, prosthesis before, before you've even gone to the final. And about 50% you know, about of patients, they actually say to me, like, I really wish I had this experience um, with previous dentures and I've actually got referrals from friends, relatives, where they've come to me simply for this reason. Um, and, you know, as I've mentioned before, time on task is no different. So um, you're not losing any actual clinical laboratory time. Now, the two disadvantages that I see are that you can't move the teeth chair side. Uh, and I get around that by actually modifying the teeth with a burr or actually um, marking with a marker whether we want to move the midline. But for me, if you're doing a really good bite block to start with, you shouldn't have those issues. And probably the next uh, issue that you might think you're going to have is that of shade. Now, when I first started going into this digital denture realm, which I did about four years ago, I thought this was going to be my biggest issue because I'm like, I want the patient to perceive what the colour they're going to look like. But if you have a good conversation with them, compare any shade tabs to the previous dentures, whether you want to go lighter or the same, I really haven't had any issues with the patients not being happy with the actual colour of the teeth. So we can see um, this is the materials that I'm, I'm using for my trial and including uh, my private patients, and they look really great in the mouth. Uh, I, I wasn't really sure at first how these were going to look or perform aesthetically, but no patient said to me, oh, you know, I, I wish I had those traditional card teeth. Uh, patients don't know what they don't know. That's the thing. And we want to give a patient a really good aesthetic result, and it is possible with printed, printed applications. So you'll see this patient's got uh, the MFH here, um, I think this is shade N1. Now, this is a very popular one, and we've got a 3D plus. And, you know, if you're doing your job right, you really shouldn't be showing that much gum anyway. So this is more about um, accuracy and, and working with a good material that actually has good physical properties, in my opinion. And this all comes down to a very important point. A lot of people that I speak to, they, they struggle with printing as, as an overall, and that's because they're not following the manufacturer's instructions. So what I think the great thing about what Nextent done is they've validated their workflow. So, you know, they've worked out design, the supports, they've already worked that out all for us. So we've got orientation. Nextent has already told us, you know, where should we print our dentures at 60 degrees to, by the way. You know, we have a specific mixing validated, mix it for this time. So we know that our materials are ready to go and they've got a very specific post-processing system as well. So you follow all these instructions, you won't have a problem. You don't follow them, you are gonna have a problem. And we start to lose sight of the fact that when we're doing things in an analog world, we've been doing it for so long that we are actually following instructions, but we forgot because it's come second nature. And then when we come to do something different, we go, oh, I want to skip steps. I think I should do it this way because it saves 30 seconds. But in the long run, it's not actually going to do that. 
So in our design software, we've got minimum thicknesses we should be adhering to and the design software actually shows us and um, Nextend has actually validated that already. Um, if you don't, you're gonna have problems with things not fitting and also errors in your, in your CAD design. This support network as well, which I spoke about earlier, that's really critical. Um, it automatically generates it for us in the 3D Sprint software. And the advantage of that is you know things are gonna print. I did a little experiment where I thought, oh, I'm gonna take some of these supports away. This is a try and I think, I can't remember what shade that was. And I took them away in that area and it didn't print. And the, the really takeaway from me was there, well, they're there for a reason. We don't want to affect, um, go introducing unsupported areas because we are going to get problems. So this really shows you that there is a validated workflow there. When we're looking at those supports, if you can't take them off easily, I am really not interested in working with a printer. And one of the reasons are time on task in the laboratory, but if you have to apply a lot of burrs where you're heating the material or distorting it to actually um, pull it off forces, which I'm not here, this is very minimal force here, then what is actually happening to that material before we've done that post-processing? So the supports really come off this material very easily, which allow us to get a good final result. <clears throat> now printing orientation uh, and studies of this is uh, something that's very near and dear to me. I have several studies underway, two are actually under review in peer reviewed journal articles. So I've printed uh, hundreds and hundreds of dentures uh, that haven't gone in the mouth where I've been doing analysis on them. Here's one of the studies. I've got a couple of others as well. But what these studies are showing is that um, indentures and indeed other geometric shapes as well, what, such as crowns and splints, that the way that you position and orientate these different geometric shapes in a printer is critical. If you think I'm just going to bang this in flat um, because it's going to take the quickest amount of time to print. Yeah, that's fine. You can do that if you like. But chances are you're going to have some issues with not only the, um, the surface um, characteristics, which means the, the trueness, but also precision and that overall shape. Uh, and we can see here, here's some different groups. I'm not going to say which ones they are. Um, this is on the next end printer. And we can see here, this is up to 300 microns of inaccuracy here. And I've actually done this in a particular way to bring some inaccuracies here, but you can get an extremely accurate result if you print at the right orientation, if you use the right support structures, and if you use your post-processing accurately. Here's an interesting case that I did uh, for, for uh, the trial actually, really, really big um, mouth, this, this gentleman. And we had some support structures there and I found, oh, it didn't quite fit what, like the way it was. And I put, I went, I went extreme. Like this is way, way above what you need to do. And when I did do this, the degree of fit was significantly better. Um, with, a, with a fit checker on that area, we had a really good result. So the takeaway from this is that these um, additional support bars, which are so easy to place on any object in 3D Sprint, really are critical for the success of any print. As is the post-processing. So we have a number of applications where we work. You have different post-processing processes for different materials, different printers, and you don't follow that, you're gonna have a problem, not only with how that material looks, but also uh, the biocompatibility of that material. And that's, that's a really important thing. And we've got a very, very clear um, set of instructions um, from next end on mixing, how long you should cure them for and how long you should wash them for. So I'm a real stickler for instructions, always following those exactly to the T. And if you don't, and here's some models I put in the wrong RPA on purpose, you're not gonna get a good result. So, you know, the specific IPA washes, here's those biological tests that I was speaking about before. So if you don't follow the instructions, this, this is the sort of result you can get and you're gonna be affecting these 
um, these ISO standards that need to be followed. So I think that just about um, wraps it up for us. And what we really need to consider is that we're doing this for patients. So here's some of mine um, with the MFH and the, and, the, and the 3D Plus, very happy people, um, happy with the aesthetics, happy with the function. And if you follow the instructions um, as far as orientation, post-processing, you're gonna get a very good result. So I suppose in summary, is this a change or an improvement? Well, I see it as both. I find that this workflow works for me. There are more advanced digital ones, but if this is an area you're trying to push your lab into uh, or, your, or your doctors, I think it's always good to, to start, start with this digital conventional workflow and then to move to more higher order workflows in incorporating intraoral scanning or skipping some of these steps as well. So um, thank you to, to Nextent uh, for inviting me to, to talk here today. I think that just about wraps up our 30 minutes and uh, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer them after the, after the session. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Andrew, uh, we already have one question on the chat. Um, I think you can see it for yourself as well. Um, it's from David Grimes. If printing using tooth colored resin, what is longevity of the resin intraorally and where? Uh, could you comment on that from your point of view? Well, my, my initial, well, firstly, we, we don't really know um, what, what is the longevity of these materials because no one had them in the mouth mouth that long and we can simulate things in an in vitro uh, environment such as with uh, thermocycling or, or wear testing those tests show us that uh, at 10,000 cycles this material performs very well but from my experience where I've had had this material in for for 12 months I'm not seeing any excessive wear I'm not seeing excess, any excessive coloration or, or staining. So from my opinion and my observations, I think this material is holding up extremely well. That's with me following the instructions though. So I'm very stickler on following that post-processing procedure. Also um, making sure we've got a good polish on it. Cause like anything in the mouth, if you don't do that, um, there's potential for issues. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Actually, uh, valid point. Follow the instructions because it does have a positive effect on the material properties. Um, let's see if there's any other questions. I don't think that we have any at the moment, so we still have a couple of moments left. We also have the virtual booth where from 3D Systems, where you could go to. Some of my colleagues are there, so if you have a question later on, they will be more than happy to, uh, to answer that, of course. So if there are no further questions, um, then also from my side, I would like to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Andrew, for uh, getting up so early and uh, thank you for this great presentation. I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Uh, thanks everybody for, uh, for watching. Enjoy the rest of the, the sessions and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing you soon, but then in real life. Thanks. Okay, no worries. Thank you.